Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we, we love you. We're grateful for you. And God, we do pray right now for each person that's here today, those in the room, those watching online or television, whatever that looks like. God, we ask that you would speak powerfully into our hearts, into our lives. We're grateful for the fact that, that you are our king, that we get to serve King Jesus, that no matter what it is that's going on in this world, no matter what it is that's happening around us, no matter what's going on politically, no matter who the president of the United States may be, God, you are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You are God, you are good, and we are grateful. And so Lord, I pray that you would just speak powerfully, even in this moment right here, right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat, I'm glad that you're here. Welcome to Freedom. Welcome to the 10. This is the 1015, right? It's 1015. Uh, we, had the, we had the nine. I should know this. Uh, we had the nine earlier. The 1145 is later. This is the 1015. That's pretty much the way that it works every single Sunday. Uh, so I'm glad that you're here. If you're watching online, if you're on vacation at the beach, uh, whatever it is you're doing, hope you're having a great day and a great weekend. Today's going to be a lot of fun. We're closing out this series all about miracles. And I think that uh, today, today we're going to talk about one of the, the miracles that's probably the most overlooked, but it might be the most powerful miracle uh, that you experience in your entire, in your entire lifetime, honestly. But I got to give you, I got to give you a fair warning. I did this earlier. I'm glad I did. Uh, this ultimately is going to be like a super encouraging message, uh, but you need to know it doesn't start there. Uh, it starts the opposite. Like when I, read, when I read some of these verses to you in a minute, you're going to be like, goodness gracious, uh, we are coming in hot. And when we do, if you brought somebody with you for the first time and like this is the first time they've come, you can just let them know, hey, it's going to get better. I promise. Uh, because these first three verses are like three of the most depressing verses in the entire Bible. And uh, that's kind of where it is that we're going to start. Here's the reason why I want to do that. Uh, number one, that's the order that the verses go in. Number two, the second reason is because sometimes to really experience how good something is, you have to remember how bad it was. And this is true in all areas of life, but this is especially true in the context of what it is that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, that being said, we're going to jump in. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Three of you are ready. The rest of you, uh, hopefully we'll get you ready. We'll get you ready before it's all said and done. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two. That's where we'll start. Ephesians chapter two is a guy named Paul. He's writing this. He kind of was like this. Um, I don't know, he was, he was almost like an overseeing elder for a whole bunch of churches in the area, churches that he had helped start. And he's writing to this church that was in a city uh, called Ephesus. He says this, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. Aren't you glad? Now you gotta remember like uh, when he was writing this, it didn't come with chapters and verses and all that stuff. He was literally writing a letter, just like you would, not an email, but an actual letter with a stamp on it and stuff. And uh, this was the letter that they got. So they pick it up, they start reading. Once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, you used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now, just to make sure you understand, because it starts off and it says once you, and you need to know that when he says once you, He's not just talking about them, he's talking about me, he's talking about you, he's talking about all of us. So just so we're clear, we're all included in this whole once you thing, destined and doomed for hell because of your many sins. Congratulations, everybody. We were destined and doomed for hell because of our sin. That's how it is that Paul starts this thing out. And just to make sure, because there's in a, in a room like this, in a room this size and in a church this size, there's always a person or five in each worship experience that doesn't think that these type verses apply to them. I wanna ask you some questions and I want you to be honest and there's some audience participation and uh, be really careful how it is that you answer. None of these are trick questions, but they do require a lot of honesty. How many of you in your entire life from the time that you were born all the way up until right now in your entire life, small, big, somewhere in between, Raise your hand if you've ever told a lie and keep it up. If you've ever told one single lie. Now, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Look around to anybody that does not have their hands up because today they told their first lie. <laughs> okay, that's good. Now, how many of you would say, now this one, it needs a little bit more explanation because when I first say it, some of you go, oh, you've never done that, but you have. How many of you have ever stolen anything? Don't raise your hand yet. You're going to in a second. 
And I already said you went like this, but that, that isn't true. You've stolen something. It could have been when you were seven years old and you went into your sister's room and you stole her clothes. You stole your mom's stuff. You stole an answer off of a test. You stole something throughout the course of your life. It could be, uh, I used to take this, this one guy, he never ate rolls at lunch and I would always take his roll. And, uh, and it, I knew that he wouldn't eat it. So I started taking it before I asked for it because I knew he wouldn't eat it anyway. Uh, but then one day he said he wanted it. Long story. I stole a roll before. I, I've probably <laughs> stolen other things. How many of you have ever stolen anything? Raise your hand. That's good. That's, that's all the honest people. All right, now this one I don't want you to raise your hand, okay? Because not, not because, not because it's, it's bad. Necess- I mean, it is bad, but it's not embarrassing. It's just I don't want to cause any type of weird conversations on a Sunday, on your way home from church. But uh, how many of you in your whole entire life have ever, don't raise your hand. Is this clear? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Everybody's done this, so it's not like everybody would still raise their hand. I just don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want you to have to have a conversation. How many of you in your whole life, don't raise your hand, have ever lusted after another person in your entire life, right? I, I had my hand up as an example, but don't do it. And the, the only reason I say don't do it is because I don't want you to go home and be like, you better have been after me, honey. That's the only person <laughs> like that. Now, here's the, here's, the problem. here's the problem with that one, with lust. Is, um, it's, very, it's very common, obviously. But one of the challenges is, it says in the book of Matthew, any man, and you can flip this, but any man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what that means is, here, here's what we just discovered. This is the 1015 worship experience at Freedom Church. The best people I know. I love all of you so, so, most of you so, so, so very much. <laughs> Uh, those of you watching online, even you, you're some of the best people ever. But here's what we just discovered. This entire 1015 worship experience is filled with lying, thieving adulterers. That's what we just discovered. So welcome to church, everybody. Welcome to church. We're glad that you are. We're glad that you're here. Um, I'm glad you're clapping. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know which one we're clapping at. Are we clapping at the lying, the thieving? I don't know. I don't know. The bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that we all know that we're guilty, okay? If you don't, you should, uh, because if you don't know that you're guilty, that also means you're delusional, which means you're guilty and delusional. But the reality is, is that what Paul is saying to these people is the same thing that he would say to us, and that is just simply that uh, we're all guilty. Now, we can deny that all day long, even though most of you did such a great job of not denying it. All of us, verse three, all of us used to live that way, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature. Those of you that have had kids, you know this to be true. That's not offensive to you. Your kids are cute, but they were born bad, right? You didn't have to have lying practice with them. You didn't have to have selfishness practice. Like you never sat them down and be like, today we're gonna teach you how to be selfish. No, those jokers, when they got old enough to use the word, everything was mine, 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 mine. You didn't teach them that. They just came out that way. And it says, we were under God's anger, just like everybody else, just like everyone else. Again, these are three of the most like depressing verses in the entire Bible. And if we stop there, the only miracle we're going to be preaching about today is like how to keep your counseling bill as low as possible, because it doesn't start off, doesn't start off very hopeful for us. Now, the next few verses. By the next few, I mean really the next six. And even beyond that, just for sake of time today, we're only going to talk about the next six. But what they do is they take this massive turn. And with this massive turn, it highlights the good news that I was talking about at the beginning of this message. Now, you got to understand the bad in order to get to the good. So just to make sure we're clear, every single one of us are guilty, right? Look to somebody next to you and just say, I'm guilty. Now look to the person you didn't choose the first time and tell them that you're guilty. Like we are, we are all guilty, every single one of us. And I know when I do that, that's every introvert's nightmare, but I'm just trying to help you overcome your personality. But the reality is every single one of us are guilty. We're not in a good spot. We're dead. It's not good to be dead. Uh, if you are in this context, you can't do anything. There's nothing you can do to fix it. You can't, you can't fix that. And so what that means is like, Paul's trying to say, you're going to need some help and you're going to need some outside intervention. It's not going to be something you can conjure up on the inside. It's not something you're going to be able to do on your own. You're going to have to 
have some outside help to be able to fix the condition that you're currently in. So he says, he wants everybody to know, like, hey, here's a couple things you need to know. We were, I mean, you could make it even more personal and say, I was, but then these next two words make all the difference in the world. And that is beginning of verse four, it says, but God, say, but God, God. is so rich in mercy and he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's special favor that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms all because we are one with Christ Jesus. We were, or I was, and then he gets to this point and he says, but God. God loved you enough that even when you were dead, he was willing to intervene on your behalf. Even when you couldn't do anything for him, even when you were in the middle of running the other direction, even when you knew what was right, but you didn't care and you kept running, even when God said slow down or he said stop and you just went running straight through the barrier like we've all done a million times, God still loved you enough to intervene for you while you were dead, while you were still a sinner. Notice that he said that. While you were still a sinner, he didn't say, I was willing to die for you once you had proven yourself to me. He didn't say, I was willing to die for you and I was willing to do this for you once you had gone to church X amount of times, once you had gotten a a set number of good days behind you and you were moving forward in the way that you should go. It's not what he said. He, He said, I loved you enough and cared about you enough and was merciful to you at such a high level that even while you were dead, even though you were still screwing up, I came lived the life that you should have lived, died the death that you should have died, and then was risen from the dead, making it possible for you to experience a brand new life. I loved you while you were still, in essence, I loved you while you were still stupid so that you could become a child and the righteousness of God. That's what it is that Paul was trying to show. Now, you got to remember who Paul was too. I didn't talk about this in the nine o'clock. Paul was a guy who, before he became a follower of Jesus, he literally was the opposite of that. He was a guy who was killing people who were followers of Jesus. Now, he wasn't, oddly enough, he wasn't doing it because he was a horrible person per se. He did it because he thought that he was doing what was right. But he would still go and he would meet people like you and me who had become followers of Jesus. And because it was messing up their religious establishment, he would either have them tortured or he would have them killed. This was Paul. He has this encounter with Christ, he's on a road to Damascus, he gets blinded, falls off this donkey, which would have been amazing to see, and then has this encounter with God, God changes his life while Paul was still a sinner, that's who he was, but God intervened, and when God intervened, he became the greatest missionary that's ever lived because of what it is that God had done in his life. And now he's saying, hey, he did that for me, but he's willing and he's able to do that for every single person that's within the sound of his voice and every person that was gonna be within sight of what it is that he had written in that letter to that church, which has now been passed down thousands of years all the way down to us. And he says, this is who I was, but God intervened. And when God intervened, everything changed in my life. And so in other words, what he's saying was you need to know It is only by God's special favor that you have been saved. In other words, it was, this is who you were, but God, by grace. By grace is super important. Because what he didn't say was, by the family you grew up in. Or by the fact that your grandpa was a preacher. Or by the fact that you go to Freedom Church. Or by the fact that you give or you serve or you're part of the dream team or you are in the parking lot when it's cold and hot and raining helping direct people. He didn't say buy any of that. He says, you're a follower of Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, it was by grace. Activated by faith 
and your belief and trust that only God can do what it is that only God can do. In other words, you don't bring anything to the table. This is what, this is what Paul's getting at. He's like, hey, you are so messed up. There is nothing good in you. And so it all depends on God if you're gonna have a relationship with God. God has to do the work, not you. You say, well, that doesn't seem right because almost everything in life, you have to do the work. So this is like counter to everything that we know. People sometimes, I've told you this illustration a lot of times about God's message being like, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm really looking for a godly woman, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not gonna belabor this, but I got another one of those emails this week. And, and I wanna say to them, which I already have, but I want to take that and say to you so that I get fewer of these messages on Instagram. And because I said to them, I said, well, what are you doing about it? Like, I'm just praying about it. I'm praying that God would send me a woman. I'm like, God doesn't send people. He doesn't send women into the basement to come into your lair. Like, what is it that you are doing? What are you growing and becoming? And where is it that you're hanging out? And are you positioning yourself in such a place where you can experience everything it is that God has for you? People at Work, if you want a promotion, you want to make money, you want to be able to do what it is that God's called you to do. If you want the raise, you want the bonus, you want all the stuff, guess what? That's not by grace through faith. That's by hard work and discipline. So if you go out into the workforce, you better bust your butt for the glory of God. Be the best employee that place has ever seen. Be the best employer those people have ever seen. Why? For God's glory. Your hard work, God equipped you to do what he's called you to do, but that's different than this. He says, it's by grace that you have been saved, if you have, through faith. Why is it by grace through faith? Here's what you need to know. Going back to the very beginning of this message, it says, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. Here's what that means. If you're dead, the reason it's by grace through faith is because I don't know if you know this. Dead people aren't very good at doing things. Some of you, some of you look surprised <laughs> when I said this. Like dead people are generally just not very good at doing stuff. If I need help moving some stuff, I'm not going to go out and find the dead. Dead people don't do things. Why not? Because they're dead. By grace, through faith. For me, I was far from God. I went to church, but I was far from God. April 11th, 1996, Jesus stepped into my life. He didn't throw me a life jacket. Jesus is not Oprah. It's not, you get a life jacket, you get a life jacket, you get a life jacket. No, he's not trying to save the drowning because you're not drowning if you're far from God. You've already drowned. You're not sitting there hoping for a life jacket. You're laying at the bottom of the sea. And the only way for you to experience this transformation, this miracle, is for God to reach down, pick your dead butt up off the bottom of the sea, breathe life into your lungs so that he can make all things new. He doesn't come so that bad people can become good people. Jesus came so that dead people could become living people. That's why it is that Jesus came to this earth. He wanted you who was dead to experience brand new life. So when I say for many of us that are followers of Jesus, the greatest miracle you're ever going to see is the one that you see when you look into the mirror every day. You are looking. If you're a follower of his, you are literally a miracle of God. You're a miracle. And that's what it is that Paul was trying to help them to understand was like, it's not about behavior modification. It's not about following rules. It's not about this list of do's and don'ts. Like that's not it is. That's not what it is that it's all about. What it is about is the fact that you got to put your trust and your faith by grace through faith in the fact that Jesus lived a perfect sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. Let's stop there. When Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't just dying on the cross. When he died on the cross, my sin was placed on Jesus. Everything I'd ever done, Everything I'd ever said, everything I'd ever thought, that's a lot. And don't look at me like that, judging me, because it's a lot for you too. It's a lot for all of us, is it not? Say yes. yes. It's a lot. And so while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was literally being crushed by the weight of our sin. So it was my sin 
that was being paid for when Jesus died on the cross. They put him in the tomb. Satan thought he had won. Three days later, Jesus comes out of that tomb, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And because Jesus is alive, it makes it possible for me and for you to experience a brand new life. Now, am I the person I want to be? Not yet. But am I the person I used to be? Not anymore. So I've been changed, but I'm still changing. I've been saved, but God is still saving. Does this make sense? And so that's what he does for you. He brings you to life and now you are saved. He places your feet upon a rock. So now when the storm comes and the winds blow and the rain comes down and we see a debate like we had to see this past week, when the storms come, we're able to stand firm because our feet are planted on the person of Jesus and he is the one that will never move. So no matter what it is that we go through, because I'm a follower of Jesus, I am now made alive. Not only am I alive, I've been adopted into his family. I've been forgiven of my sin. People sometimes will say, well, I'm just a, who are you? I'm just a sinner saved by grace, by God. That's Jesus. I don't know why I always go to that, that kind of like redneck tone, but. No, you're not. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not just a sinner saved by grace. Because Jesus didn't just forgive you of your sin. He also, just like your sin was placed on Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus, his righteousness was placed on you. So now, watch this. Am I the person I want to be? Nope, not yet. Am I the person I used to be? Not at all. I am the righteousness of God. That means that when God sees me, he likes what he sees. He's like, that's my boy. Listen, even you on your worst day, that's my girl right there. I'm not just a little pouty sinner saved by grace. No, I am the righteousness of God. I've been adopted into his family. I am a child of the king. That's who it is that I am. But it's not because of me. Like I'm not, I'm not any of that because I'm a pastor. You can be... You can be far from God and be a pastor. I am all that, not because of me, but because of what God has done in me and through me and for me. Jesus is the hero of the story. I'm not the hero of anything. If you've been changed by the person of Jesus, I don't care how bad your past was, you are not the hero of your story. Matter of fact, if you have made yourself the hero of the story, it could be that you have engaged in a behavior modification project and you know about Jesus, but you don't actually know Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the story. It says, verse eight, God saved you by grace when you believed. And I like this. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so none of us can boast about it. I like verse 10 a lot. For we are God's masterpiece. Look to somebody around you and say, I am a masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. I don't don't know how you are, but every morning when I get up, Typically, unless I'm going to the gym first and then I take a shower at the gym. But if, I, if I'm not going to the gym in the morning, I get up, I take a shower, get out, stand in front of the mirror, brush your teeth, all that stuff. This is not something I normally think. Typically, I have not stood in front of a mirror right out of the shower, dropped that towel and been like, that's a masterpiece right there. <laughs> that's not, that generally doesn't happen. I go to the gym five days a week. I eat pretty daggum healthy almost all the time, except for on cheat nights. God bless them, and I thank God for them, and I pray that more shall come. (laughs) But God says, if you're a follower of Jesus, he says, of all the things I've created, think about that. Everything that God has created, everything you've ever seen, the sky, the sea, the mountains, everything that God's created, he says, my favorite. And the masterpiece, the pinnacle of my creation was you. 
It was me. He said, you are the masterpiece of God. Of everything that he created, he says, you're the best thing that I've created. The pinnacle, the top. You don't get better than that. For we, me and you, those of us that are followers of Jesus, we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus so that we could do the good things that he planned for us long ago. He's our healer. He makes all things new. We are his prized possession. We've been forgiven of our sin. We've been adopted into his family. The old has passed away. All things have become new. We were not drowning. We were dead. And God, through the person of Jesus, reached down, picked us up off the bottom of the sea and breathed life into our soul. And that's what it is that he desires to do for every single person that's in this room that has never experienced what it is that only God can do. Now, some of us in here, we've been followers of Jesus for years, decades. Others for months, weeks, maybe even days. If you're already a follower of Jesus, what I want this message to do for you is I want you to walk out of here with your head held high and your chin up just a little bit and stop moping around and stop saying I'm just a sinner saved by grace and instead recognize that you are a child of the king, a masterpiece, a trophy of God's grace. Like that's who it is that you are. You are so much more than you think you are. But it's not because of you. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's because of what God has done in you and through you and for you. He is the hero. But there's others of you and you've been coming to church or maybe you haven't. You've been serving, giving, or maybe you haven't. You grew up around God or maybe you didn't. But for many of you, you've been trying to do this thing on your own. You've been trying to pull yourself up. Or if I were to say to you, just like I did at the beginning, and say, I want you to raise your hand right now. Like if you know, don't do it. But if you know that you're a follower of Jesus, like in other words, if you know that your sin's been forgiven, your life has been changed, that heaven will be your home, that if you were to die today, the next person you would see would be the face of Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want you to, don't do it. But I want you to raise your hand. Many of you, your hand was shoot up. It was like me, April the 11th, 1996, I said yes to Jesus. My life was changed. I'm not who I want to be, but I'm not who I used to be because of the goodness of God in my life. Many of you can say that. But if I were to go around the room and ask you individually, and you didn't have to worry about what, other, what everybody else thought, and it was just you and me, and you were having a real deal conversation, and you weren't lying to yourself, and you weren't lying to God, and you weren't lying to me. And I said to you, do you know, like, do you know for sure that if you were to die today, the heaven is your home. Do you, know, like, do you know that? You know the answer I would get a lot? I think so. I'm pretty sure. Or I hope so. I hope so, I do, I hope so. I hope, I hope that I've done enough. If you're banking on whether you've done enough, let me give you the answer. You haven't because you can't, because you're dead. And dead people can't do things. Jesus didn't come so that you could hope so. Jesus didn't come so that you would think so. Jesus didn't come so that you could try to make it so. But he did come so that you may know that you know that you know that you know that your sin has been forgiven, that your heart has been changed that heaven is your home. Not that everything is perfect in your life because it never will be, but that you have someone who sticks with you closer than a brother that will never leave you, never turn his back on you, never forsake you. He'll always walk with you, before you, behind you, beside you. He'll guide your steps every moment of every day. We were, but God, by grace. Or to make it more personal, I was, but God, by grace. First John chapter five says this, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, watch this, that you may know that you have eternal life. 
and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I have written these things. What things? Everything it is that I just read to you. I have written these verses down for you so that you can what? So that you can know. It's the summertime. 1015 a.m. worship experience. Ackworth, Georgia. And God cares about you enough to have a message like this with words written like this. Why? So that you can know. He wants you to know. He doesn't want to watch you walk out of this room hoping so or thinking so or trying hard so that it may one day be so. He says, I've already made it so. If you will put your trust and your faith and your hope in me by grace through faith. It's possible that by grace through faith, this is how amazing God's grace is. By grace through faith, it's possible that you walked into these doors dead and on your way to hell. And you can walk out of these doors alive and on your way to heaven because God is that good and because he loves you that much. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you the opportunity right now. One, I'm gonna give you the opportunity if you're already a follower of Jesus, just to say, God, when we pray, God, thank you for changing me, for making me move from death to life. I want you to go home. You can look in the mirror. You can do it in your car when you get in the car and look into the, into the mirror and be like, I'm a masterpiece. You can, you can post it online if you want to, Instagram, but if you do it in the shower, make sure you got your clothes on. I am a masterpiece. Because some of you like to post without your clothes on. I am a masterpiece of God. I think sometimes people forget that I follow them. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a masterpiece of God. That was funnier than I thought it was going to be. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, my prayer for you is that you would have heard from God and now you will do what he says. And what is that? Remember, I have written these things so that you may know. Jesus loved you enough and cared about you enough and was grace filled and mercy filled towards you enough that he's willing to pick you up off the bottom of the sea and breathe life into your soul. And he can do that now, now, like in this room. And so if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, with your heads bowed and eyes closed all over this room today, everybody here, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, I want you to just pray this prayer with me as I prayed out loud. Hear me though, it's not a magical prayer. But Jesus says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved, changed, and forgiven. And so that's what it is that I'm inviting you into right now, is that you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead so that you will be forgiven and you will be filled with the person of the Holy Spirit of God and he will change you from the inside out because he is God and because he is good and because he loves you that much. And so all over this room and those of you watching online, if you're here today and you're ready to say yes to Jesus, just pray this prayer with me. As I prayed out loud, say, Lord, the best way I know how, I turn from my sin, I turn to Jesus. I'm asking you, to become the Lord and the Savior of my life. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And as a result, I'm asking you to save, change, and forgive me. Thank you for doing what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. With your head still bowed and eyes still closed, if you're here today, I would love to be able to see who it is that you are if you just prayed to say yes to Jesus. And so what's gonna happen is this, in just a moment, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I count to three, I'm gonna ask you to take a bold step. And that is simply to raise your hand high. I want you to keep that hand up just long enough for one of our ushers to come and place a card in your hand. And as soon as you get that card, you can pull your hand right back down. If you're watching online, just follow the instructions that you will see right there on your screen. But this is a pivotal moment. I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna have you stand. I'm not gonna embarrass you in any way. But if you just said yes to Jesus, when I say three, I want you to throw that hand up high to acknowledge that you just made the greatest decision of your life by grace, through faith. I was but God, 
by grace. If that's you, right where you are when I say three, throw that hand up. You ready? One, two, three. Come on, all over the room. If that's you, raise your hand high. We see hands all over in the middle, several in the middle. Good job, those towards the back as well, over on my left. That's great. Now do me a big favor, everybody in the room, stand to your feet, if you would. Stand to your feet, if you would. I'm gonna pray for you. The band will sing, give you a little bit more instruction. And uh, I'm gonna say this, two miracles happened today, already, two. Number one, a bunch of people just said yes to Jesus, so we can give God praise for that. The second miracle is, I'm gonna finish this message with about three minutes and 36 seconds left on that clock. That is a miracle. <laughs> Dear Lord, I love you, I'm grateful for you, and I pray right now for every person here today, I pray that you would move powerfully in their heart and in their life. Thank you for those that said yes to Jesus. Thank you for those that already are followers of Jesus. God, help us to remember who we are, that we are the children of God. We've been adopted into your family. We are the righteousness of God and we are children of the King. Help us to not only know it, but help us to live that out day by day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.